Hi. So a lot of people know me as a coconut. Now growing up in America to Indian parents, I've lived this experience of being a coconut, brown on the outside and white on the inside. Now there are a couple of coconut rules. You don't date until after marriage. <laughs> and A minus haunts you until your next reincarnation. And your name is usually something like Chitur Gopalakrishnan Vishwanathan Swami Nathan Kashi Ayer. Or to your Starbucks barista, Charlie. <laughs> now, I'm not like the other coconuts. While other kids were going to coding camp or pre-med conferences, I was going to those too. But I never really found myself enjoying the intricacies of STEM. Instead, I found myself enthralled by the hooks of music, the escapism of theater, the beauty of the visual arts. Now, this is the point in the presentation where a lot of the Asian parents in the crowd start to get a little bit scared. Yeah, she's talking about art? <laughs> to which I say, I mean, you're not wrong. Just take a moment and ask yourself, what are four mainstream Indian artists in America? Hasan Minhaj, Mindy Kaling, Priyanka Chopra, and Aziz Ansari. Can we give them a round of applause, by the way? Like, wow. <laughs> I'm acting like they're ever going to see this, but. <laughs> now on the other hand, if you ask anyone, what are some mainstream white actors and actresses, you can name Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Jennifer Aniston, and like a hundred more. And so I started to realize this somewhere around 2018 that, hey, maybe Shilpi Aunty was right. Maybe an art career isn't viable. And that's the story of how I became an engineer. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> but in all honesty, I once, once I realized this, I had this washed out dream of this once vivid vision of being an artist. My name wasn't on the billboards anymore. It was more like I was the person cleaning the billboards, which great career, but ask my mom, I suck at cleaning. And slowly I started to realize that I need to look for something a little more practical. Now I wanna switch gears for a second. By a show of hands, how many of you either have a social media account or know someone with a social media account? Wow, I'm surprised that's not everyone. <laughs> Now, I want to ask, how many of you have seen someone post hashtag pray for insert place here? How many of you have liked, retweeted, maybe even been the person to post that? Now, I got an Instagram when I was 12, which is, to put it in perspective, back when Google Plus was still a thing. So, pretty long ago. And I remember as a 12-year-old, I, I was into what other 12-year-old boys were into. So Minecraft, Legos, and every sixth grader's dream, science camp. And I remember going onto Instagram, it was completely new and foreign to me. And one day I accidentally clicked on hashtag feminism. Now, I remember going on there and being exposed to this huge variety of new information. And it led me to ask my parents some questionable things like, hey mom, what's an abortion? Or dad, what's police brutality? Keep in mind I was 12 years old, so. And in all honesty, this basic human rights being debated and polarized all over the internet put me in shock. Why didn't women deserve the same pay? My mom works just as hard, sometimes even harder. Social media has been a cornerstone to my life. And I remember learning so many things from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and yes, even Google+. But one thing I always noticed was this alarming trend. 
In 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, and immediately we all jumped towards hashtag pray for Puerto Rico. Now two weeks later, the Las Vegas shooting occurred, and all of a sudden it was like Puerto Rico wasn't even on the map. It was always pray for Las Vegas, pray for Texas, pray and pray and pray. And at one point, there was nothing you could do but pray. Now I get it, I get it. Faith is important in times of crisis. Faith brings communities together, acts as a metaphorical shelter in times of need. Faith has this ability to bring change, but in social media, we use it as the opposite. One thing that really disturbed me was that every time one of these tragedies would occur, a celebrity would post something like hashtag pray for Parkland, and all of a sudden, they began, became one of the world's leading human rights activists. And I began thinking, can faith really bring the change we need? You know, there's this quote by President Obama that says, we can't wait for some other person or some other time. We are the change that we seek. And I think we need to focus on that first line more because everyone tweets out that last line. No one ever thinks, we can't wait. We can't wait for some other person or some other time. Now being 15 with all these thoughts in my head, I was kind of overwhelmed. So I turned towards the only sanctuary I knew, art, specifically music and writing. And I remember coming across this one poem on Facebook one day where this man looked at the viewer in the video straight in the eyes and said, when are we going to talk about it? It was a slam poet talking about Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, more and more schools that had faced the same tragedy and asked, when is it time to talk about it? That night, I dived into a deep rabbit hole of people who used their art to create change. Poems that talked about the harsh reality of being poor in a system that favors the mental health of the rich. Staccato verses about police brutality. This was the word world of artivism. Now, artivism is a movement that combines art and advocacy with people who combine their lives and livings into one. It stems from this idea of touching people's hearts, using the emotion behind art to make sure that other people can feel the pain of marginalized communities. And artivism, the best thing about it is its accessibility. Not everyone has the time to go out and march in every single protest or con constantly badger their representatives. I mean, as someone on the verge of her senior year, I know how overwhelming things may be. But artivism can be for someone from the streets or the suburbs. It can be for one person or an entire population. Because what artivism does is focuses on the individual person instead of viewing a population through probability. Now at this point, Shilpi Auntie is getting very offended again. No bacha of hers is going to pursue an art career, but artivism isn't a career. Every time you see a coexist mural, a poem on Instagram talking about a mass tragedy, that is the reach of artivism. Artivism isn't a career, it's simply a promise to touch people's hearts through music and through paintings and through poems. Now, I remember looking at the world of artivism and being amazed, but I also remember thinking, what do I do now? Because I knew that I couldn't pursue a career in art, but maybe it wasn't impossible to integrate it. Maybe if I wanted to go into politics, Maybe if I wanted to go into STEM, into education. Art is universal. And there's no rule saying that you can't integrate this and your beliefs into one. Now, sometimes I wish that my future self would come back and give me some advice. Because let's be honest, high school is crazy. And yes, I know, I'm young. In college, it'll get worse. But right now, 
I want to give a piece of advice to my past self. So a quick letter to my past self. I know how you feel. I know you feel insignificant and unimportant. I know you feel like just another dot on the map. But I want you to remember that alone, no one can create change. But when we band together, we can revolutionize the world. And yes, some days things will be terrifying. You'll look up and climate change will seem imminent. Thoughts and prayers will act as a poorly constructed shield against tragedies and nightmares. And the news will rattle off numbers that will at first confuse you, but ultimately terrify you. And I want you to know that it's okay to be scared. What's not okay is to lose hope. Because you are standing behind this generation that sweats and bleeds for that hope. You're standing behind a generation built of civilians and heroes alike. People who aren't scared to breathe after being stifled for so long. And you are one of those people. I want you to remember that humans are extraordinary. You know, as humans, we have the ability to be the bringers or the barriers towards real change. And I hope that one day you'll remember the importance of being the former. And I want you to remember to hope. Hope that your generation and others will keep their promises. Hope that you'll be able to create a lasting impact on the world. And most importantly, hope for the best. Because with everyone behind you, you will become the change you seek. Thank you.